Hello, everyone. Welcome to the University of the Underground. We are a free, pluralistic, transnational university and also charity founded in 2017 in the basement of a nightclub in Amsterdam. I am Naum, the health program of I Want to Believe, an investigation into religion and belief systems as part of a three month residency to see how religions and spirituality relate to economics, politics, society, and nation states. I would like to welcome our uh, researchers and also to any visiting participants or anyone else watching this video. I also kindly ask you to go to our website and donate whatever you can so we can keep running these programs, paying our lecturers and do important work. Today, we are going to have a 40 minute talk followed by 15 minute Q&A with our special guest, Iwan Chardonnay, uh, who also happens to be a good friend of mine. And let me tell you a little bit about Iwan. He is an author, journalist, curator, and investigative artist, currently acting as a curator for artists in residence programs at the Roscoff Marine Station in Brittany, France. He has since the early 90s participated in many artistic endeavors and published as an essayist in, numer in numerous publications. He has lectured uh, a lot. He's a co-founder with the artist group uh, Bureau de Attitude, the artist group of uh, the laboratory Planet Journal. Uh, Ewan is very active in the field of space culture for over 20 years already. And his last publication is a nonfiction narrative book on the secret history of the American space program called uh, the Mojave Epiphany. So today we're gonna explore about some of the more magical ideas and cult ideas behind the space programs. So Ewan, the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Naum, for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm a writer, journalist, um, also artist, mostly working in uh, artist collective. Um, my relation to space culture started uh, by being part of the Association of Autonomous Astronauts. Uh, it was a network of um, artists, activists, writers back in the 90s. I uh, published a book in France in 2001 called Escape from Gravity, Kip Taylor Gravité, was collecting different uh, texts from that uh, network. And I continued working in the field of space culture, becoming uh, now a journalist as a historian, space uh, astronautics, history of astronautics for Ciel et Espace, which is a press magazine in France, and also developing art and science and art and space um, programs or research programs. Um, I will go with the presentation and I will share my screen. Is it okay? Yes, it works. Okay, thanks. So I will do uh, two, two uh, I will develop two narratives, one in Russia and one in the uh, United States um, as a, like the early days of uh, space uh, uh, rocketry or space science, uh, the origin and how it connects to some like or religion or occultist uh, background or groups. Uh, the first sort of story I want to tell it's about um, it's about, um, uh, so here's a cover of my book, Mojave Epiphany. Uh, it was published in 2016. It's only in French. I hope that one day it will be translated, translated in English. Let's see. Uh, this book tells mostly the story of the foundation of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory back in the 1930s until the mid 50s the creation of NASA basically. And it tells the story of the founders who had like particular uh, past. Some um, got really in troubles during the McCarthy times uh, being accused for being communist, whether they were really part of like uh, communist un student unions in the 1930s or were they part of some uh, anarchist or cultist groups such as uh, Jack Parsons, I, I will tell you a bit more later on. I will start by, um, going first in uh, Russia, because Russia has been probably the, um, 
uh, it's the, the origin of the, um, let's say, uh, rocketry and, and astronautics uh, go, goes back to Russia at first, in the, in the back in the 19th century. And um, it's often argued that the, this crazy of cosmic navigation has its roots in uh, cosmism. Cosmism is a technophile futurology born in the 19th century whose uh, century-old quote perfectly sums up its orientation from Konstantin Tcholkovsky, you see on the left. The earth is a cradle of mankind, but one does not spend one's whole life in a cradle. Um, Konstantin Tcholkovsky, who wrote the first astronautic uh, treaty, um, was born in 1857 in south of Moscow. And he was um, he, he's still con today considered to be the father of the Russian space program. And, uh, and even of modern astronautics in general worldwide. Um, Tchaikovsky was a good student. He was hearing impaired, but so he was sent to Moscow at 16 by his parents to study in city's library. And there he met um, Nikolai Fyodorov, which you see a statue on, on the right, um, who was an eccentric philosopher and futurologist uh, who wrote many articles. He was a librarian. He wrote many articles, but he was re always refusing to be published during his lifetime because he was also opposed to intellectual property. But in his text, Fyodorov defends the ideas that both physical immortality and the resurrection of the dead are achievable through science. It's a time where there's a lot of hope in, uh, in modern science. And so as a, with a background in uh, Orthodox religion, Fyodorov, um, match the, this idea of resurrection of the dead that uh, come from Christianity to, to, um, to a more uh, futurology or technophile uh, uh, ideas. So um, following the logic of like, reaching physical immortality, we could say also this cosmism is also at the root of the transhumanism today, huh? the quest for, for immortality through science. But the uh, cosmism adds uh, this idea of the resurrection of the dead, like means collecting the, the uh, dead souls, wandering the cosmos and to resurrect them. Um, so following the logic, um, Fyodorov was believing that population growth in, will require uh, the conquest of space. He wrote in 8080, I, I, I quote, for the men of earth, the walls of space will contain the homes of their ancestors, and these walls will be accessible to the resurrected and to those who will be resurrected. The exploration of the interstellar space means a search for these habitable worlds and the preparation of these homes. Over the cities and towns, one can now observe the flight of many airships as an invitation for our brains to ponder how to open the road to heaven. This conquest of the road to space is absolutely imposed upon us as a duty to prepare for the resurrection. Without taking possession of new spaces, there will not be enough room on earth for the coexistence of all the resurrected generations. This uh, idea of resurrection of the dead also had a strong influence in, uh, in Soviet Russia, you know, with uh, Lenin and uh, like mummification of Lenin, for instance. And I, I won't go too much in the resurrection of the dead section of the cosmism, but focus more on the astronautics in, in his, his influence on the astronautics. So yeah, Fyodorov had a profound influence on, on Konstantin Tcholkovsky, and um, as well as many other writers such as Leon Tostoy or Vladimir Soloviev or Fyodor Dostoevsky. They were all interested in, in this uh, quote philosophy of Fyodorov. Um, another here you see Fyodorov on the left. He was also very interested in like Zeppelin and it was the very beginning of the design of those kind of things. And on the right, you see a, 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 an interpretation drawing of another um, pure pioneer of rocketry who was called Nikolai Kibalcic. And it was uh, the same year uh, about the Tcholkovsky wrote his first technical essay on astronautics. Um, so um, Nikolai Kibalcic was a chemist and he was a part of this terrorist group called Narodnaya Volia, means the people's will, um, communist anarchist terrorist group. And he was sentenced to death in 1881 for the assassination of the Tsar Alexander II. 
uh, during his brief incarceration, he wrote an uh, original project for a rocket propelled flying object and uh, planned a power rocket engine controlling the trajectory by bonif modifying the angle of inclination of the engine, the combustion rate, the stability of the device, etc. Um, it's interesting to see that also it roots uh, astronautics to some uh, obscure terrorist groups and responsible of. Uh, the assassination of uh, Alexander the Second Tsar. So um, this uh, cosmic mythology and uh, Tiolkoki was uh, wrote in just two years after a book called Free Space in 1883 in the form of a diary in which the narrator is a man in space free from the force, forces of gravity. And in, in, in it, he un envisaged the jet rockets as the only way to leave gravity behind. Um, and introduce the equation for the minimum velocity of release from Earth's attraction. No, it's known as the Tcholkovsky equation, equation. He continued to research models of airships, imagine an orbital lift and then a metal craft um, and bird-like flying machines. In 1895, he wrote Dream of Earth and Sky in which he imagined the colonization of space by man. And in 1903, uh, he, he wrote the exploration of cosmic space using jet engines when he summarized the technical base, basis of the rocket, suggesting in particular the use of liquid, liquid propellant, such as liquid oxygen, which would be used 70 years later to free oneself from Earth's attraction. Um, although this work is not considered a founding book of astronautics, it was ignored totally at, at the time by the Tsarist regime. Um, the year 1903 was also the year of um, uh, Fyodorov's death. His writings were published post-mortem. He didn't want to publish in, in his lifetime in, uh, in a book called The Philosophy of the Common Cause. Uh, it was very important in the times in, in, in Russia, pre-Soviet pre Russia. The first volume came in uh, 1906. And, um, so here you have drawings of uh, Tsiolkovsky imagining like a man in space, um, Tsiolkovsky with a Zeppelin. And the second volume of the philosophy of the common cause, um, uh, sorry, the first volume, sorry, in 1908, influenced a lot the, um, the Bolshevik leader of the failed revolution of 1905, uh, Alexander Bogdanov. Um, at the time, the Bolshevik party was uh, divided in two tendencies, the Lenin one and the Bogdanov one. Lenin was in exile, and in 1905, uh, Bogdanov was kind of leading the, the attempt of revolution that didn't work out. Here you have a photo of them, a refugee in Capri in Italy, with also Maxim Gorky in the middle, who was also very influenced by Fyodorov's writings. And um, really influenced by... Uh, uh, Fyodorov, um, Bogdanov wrote, uh, where was kind of, let's say, put aside or expelled from the, direct, the directing board of the Bolshevik party. And he dedicated his life uh, time at the, in, the, in those years, in the, between 1908 and 1917, to literature and wrote um, uh, science fiction novels, including The, the Red Star. Uh, which is a, a science fiction novel published in 1908, where he projected this ideal uh, Martian uh, socialist society, so on planet Mars, with rocket technology, automation. In that way, he was prefiguring cybernetics. And also the idea was very strange in the book that the idea that blood transfusion could be the means of overcoming death. Um, later on, uh, Bogdanov started the first transfusion, blood transfusion center in Soviet Russia, dedicated a lot of his lifetime to research blood transfusion uh, to, um, again, extend lifespan, even maybe go towards uh, this idea of uh, maybe immortality or over overcoming death. Uh, the second volume of the philosophy of the common cause was published in 1913. And uh, it confirms the influence of Fyodorovian philosophy on Russian futurology. A group of artists who call themselves the uh, Baldist of the future or the Futurist Slavs, uh, there was a Russian version of the Futurist movement launched by uh, the Italian Filippo Marinetti in 1909. 
and uh, they encountered the ideas of Fyodorov and uh, also of Tsiolkovsky. They, they were following conferences of Tsiolkovsky at the um, uh, World Fair um, at the Luna Park in Petersburg and were very much influenced. Among them was Kazimir Malevich, who designed the set and scenography at the time for their opera, this cubo-futurist um, uh, opera called Victory Over the Sun, where he was also writing such things like, I quote, when on enormous Zeppelin, great cities and the studios of contemporary artists will stand, means they were imagining like the really uh, airborne or space cities in their futuristic views in the 19, it was 1913. Um, yeah, like when he was following this Konstantin Tolkovsky all metal airship models at the, um, at the uh, Luna Park in, in 1914, just before World War I. Um, Mardevich also wrote that his canvas was analogous to cosmic space, I quote, indeed in man, in his consciousness, there is a tension towards space, the attraction of the tearing away of the, of the globe. Um, yeah, so this ground was seemed to have been laid for this cosmic dream and with the revolution of 1917, the um, avant-garde artists and scientists were very quickly promoted by the new regime, as we know. And they, at the age of 60, Tsiolkovsky was also suddenly recognized and appointed by the Academy of Science of the new USSR. Malevich also became really enthusiastic about the revolutionary movement and led the foundation for an avant-garde group called the Suprematist Movement which led him to an and students to imagine uh, what is interesting, it's orbital stations. I quote again in the Unovis world in 1920, Unovis was like the towards the cosmos. Uh, the quote is, each suprematist body constructed will fit into the natural organization in accordance with the laws of physical nature and will form by itself a new satellite. It is enough to find the relationship, relationship between two bodies running in space, the earth and the moon. Between them, there will be a new suprematist satellite that can be constructed, equipped with all the elements, a satellite that will move in orbit, having traced his new route. You can see here, like it's not a drawing, it's not a painting by um, Malevich, but by someone of the suprematist movement, it's uh, Ilyas Chashnik, but you can definitely see a suprematist construction orbiting um, a red planet or a red star body. Um, later on, um, in the, or like in the same year, 1920, there was um, another group get formed called the Biocosmist. It was a reinterpretation of the cosmist philosophy of, um, of Fyodorov. Uh, again, um, let's say, uh, having also the, 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 the dream of acquisition of physical immortality and the ability to transform and control the universe, to manage time, to raise the dead from their grave. And it was at the time this group, Biocosmist, was coming from, let's say, the anarchist uh, section of the revolution. The founder of Biocosmism was Alexander Agienko, a pseudonym under the pseudonym Sviatogor, and Alexander Yaroslavsky. The beginning of this current took shape with the creation of two literary groups of young artists and poets in Moscow in December 1920. And in 1991, Sviatogor and Ivanitsky, entitled in an article called Biocosmic Vault, I quote, all the histories that preceded the first organic manifestation of life on Earth up to the upheaval of recent years is an epoch, but it it is now an age of death and small thing. We are beginning a great era of immortality and infinity. In, in December 1921, Sviatogo and supporters signed a manifesto declaring the mission of so-called anarcho-universalism or anarcho-cosmism or biocosmism, co complete and dissolving all dissident anarcho-universalist organizations. I, I can quote uh, Sviatogo. Um, they, but before I would say in 1922, the Biocosmist group began to publish journals called, one was called Biocosmist in Moscow with Agienko as editor and another one was called Immortality in Petrograd with Jaroszewski as editor. 
these are these journals presented articles in biocosmics on selection of poem or science fiction stories. And they were, but soon they were persecuted. And in the Petrograd group led by Yaroslavsky split from the organization. And soon the November 22, the journal Immortality was closed down by decision of the Petrograd executive in charge of pornography. I can quote an interesting um, um, text by Sviatogor. It's in Biocosmics Poetics. Uh, it's published in the book uh, edited by Boris Groys, Russian Cosmism. Um, it, I will quote now. Now let's go down to the question on how to realize personal immortality. It is time for us to dispense with the necessity of death and the balance that includes natural death. Every law is indeed only an expression of the temporary balance of particular powers. You have only to introduce new forces or remove some of the existing forces to destroy a given balance, harmony. If we set the forces of immortality in motion, then even in the face of position, these forces will be able to destroy the balance that includes death, replacing it with immortality. Indeed, every life strives for immortality above all else. Our agenda also includes in, 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 in victory over space. Let's not refer to it as aeronautic. It is not enough, but rather to space travel. Our Earth must become a spaceship steered by the wise will of the biocosmist. It is a horrifying fact that from time immemorial, the Earth has orbited the sun like a goat tethered to its shepherd. It's time for us to instruct the Earth to take another course. In fact, it is also time to intervene the course taken by other planets too. We should not remain mere spectators, but must play an active role in the life of the cosmos. Our third task is the resurrection of the dead. What concerns us here is the immortality of the individual in the fullness of his spiritual and physical powers. The resurrection of the dead involves the full reconstruction of those who are already dead and buried. The sad said, the quagmire of religion of mysticism is not for us. We are too grounded for that and are in the fact in the process of waging war on religion and mysticism. Yeah. So I will maybe close now and move to the United States. Uh, here is a, um, a film of, from 1936, The Cosmic Journey. Uh, Cosmic Journey was uh, very much influenced by uh, the person of Tsiolkovsky and his uh, utopian ideas and rockets and design. Of course, during his lifetime, nothing was really built. And the Russian space program was mostly working on, like, let's say, small rocket test and so on, but was producing a lot of literature and a lot of utopian ideas. And so in, it's interesting then to see this movie from 1936. It's also the year of the um, beginning of the United States uh, Jet Propulsion Lab and we could say the first space research lab in the United States in um, uh, Pasadena, uh, Los Angeles, California. So I will now move to this group. Um, so the, the, the first, so the, the group of the founder of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory were students of the California Institute of Technology um, in um, 1936 under the, um, the direction of uh, Theodor von Karman, who was an aerodynamicist from Hungary, a very known scientist of the time who was uh, Jewish and who left um, uh, Germany to teach in California. And so um, they are done the, this aerodynamicist, von Karman created, a, took a group of students with passionate students, very much influenced by uh, science fiction readings, such as Astounding, or, um, comic books and so on, to, um, to start research on rocketry. Among them, you had uh, in the middle with the hat, is, uh, Frank Malina. Frank Malina um, became the first director of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and he was also known uh, late, later in the 60s to become an artist, uh, a kinetic, art, kinetic artist and the founder of the Leonardo Art and Science magazine 
in uh, 1968 and would still exist today and is still published and a, a great reference for the art and science community. But so he was a founder with uh, other scientists. Among them, you have Jack Parson, the second person on the left. He was a he was not a Caltech student at first. He was more a self-taught chemist. Um, Parsons was uh, coming from a wealthy family that got ruined during the 1929 crisis, uh, financial crisis, and started to work very young in uh, chemical companies, building explosives and stuff like that, and, and got uh, really interested in, uh, in building rockets at some point through science fiction readings. Um, here you have Jack Parsons. He was also sometimes expert some, on some explosions or bombings. Um, and the originality of Parsons, he was um, very much interested in magic and religion. Uh, he was reading um, a lot of books in, and a great influence on him was a golden ball from uh, um, James Fraser, a very important uh, three volumes book uh, of the time. And then he discovered the uh, Book of Law of um, Alistair Crowley in, um, one day in a library and got really interested in, in Crowley uh, philosophy and writing. I don't know if you're familiar with Alistair Crowley, but Alistair Crowley was a British occultist. Um, uh, Crowley was first uh, in, introduced to the Golden Dawn um, group in the 80, 80, 80 90, 90s. Coley was also very well uh, skilled and known um, uh, alpinist. He did several times um, uh, Himalayas and encountered various, um, uh, let's say, religion and in his, in his travels as, a, as an alpinist. He joined the Golden Dawn, which was a kind of Freemason uh, group, also very much influenced by um, well, we can say Enochian magic. Enochian magic comes from uh, um, uh, uh, John Dee, um, the advisor of the Queen Elizabeth in the 16th century, who was practicing Enochian magic. Enochian magic being the, um, the voices of the angels and how to channel them and how to interpret them. So um, there was a tradition of, uh, of Enochian magic that was revived by the Golden Dawn. And, and Crowley joined that group. But the Golden Dawn was also quite a Freemason tradition with a lot of hierarchical levels. And moreover, very, let's say, um, uh, 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 patriarchal. Or con and Crowley was having a, was a queer or gay or bisexual. And he was expelled from the Golden Dawn at some point. Um, and uh, later on, he met with um, Theodoreus. Theodoreus was also from the Golden Dawn, but they were both having interest in rituals and sex magic. And they revived and uh, they created a group called the Ordo Templi Orientis. Uh, they also joined in uh, during World War I in uh, Switzerland at Monte Verita. You see a photo down top, top right, uh, down right of Monte Verita, and they uh, made the basic. Um, rituals and degrees, um, again, based on Masonic uh, degrees with nine degrees of initiation of the Ordo Templi Orientis, which is mean the uh, East Temple uh, Order. And so Reus and Crowley uh, really constituted that group, but at some point they really got in, in, a, in a dispute and separated and Collis to, took over uh, the OTO as, it, as, as itself, created also the Astrum Argentum, the one-to-one -one initiation process, where you have just, uh, you meet uh, just a master, and then you have your own uh, student, was at the Astrum Argentum, the Ordo Templi Orient is having, organizing still a Gnostic mass and collective mass. And after the um, degree seven, eight, and nine, in, uh, starting with the degree seven, in the Ordo Templi Orientis, you have you include the sex magic rituals uh, in the in the in the process of initiation. Um, here, Crowley, late, much later on, I mean, in the forties, old man, he was also um, quite an heroin addict, 
and was relying a lot of uh, adepts of the cult of the Ordo Tempi Orientis club, cult and group. And um, uh, um, our character from California, Jack Parson, got interested in um, in the Ordo Tempi Orientis through meeting the lodge of uh, Los Angeles. The Lodge of Los Angeles was created by Wilfred Talbot Smith, here on the left. Uh, he was an English occultist and ceremonial magician and a prominent advocate of the Telema philosophy. The Telema philosophy is the, the, the one you saw just before. This philosophy comes from Rabelais, the French writer. It's this do what you do what you will shall be the wall of the law. So it's about the free will. And uh, if you act according your free will, yeah, there's no guilt in, in at play. You, as soon as you're in, uh, in accordance of your free will, you are, you are well seen, let's say, by God, at least in Rabelais. Uh, but um, Crowley took this really as a very central um, philosophy of the Telema religion and the Ordo Templi Orientis. And so um, uh, Wilfred Tablo Smith became the leader of of the of the of the OTO in California, he was first born in Kent in UK, but then moved to Canada. And when he arrived in Los Angeles, or in, first in San Francisco, and but then in Los Angeles, he started with another occultist called Jane Wolf, who was in Italy with uh, Crowley in the twenties when he started a, a Telema group uh, in Sicily. And Regina Kahl was also Hollywood uh, uh, actress and occultist from Los Angeles to, to start a new tele, Telemite community, a new OTO. So they, they founded and incorporated the Church of Telema in Los Angeles, and they would give public performances of the Gnostic Mass from their home in Hollywood. It was also a refuge for many of the queer community. It was a time of, uh, of the, um, uh, in Hollywood, of the, you know, uh, moral restrictions and a lot of, um, um, let's say polyamorous queers where we're finding refuge in uh, in the church of telema as a, you know they were well seen were well well welcome um since the telema had this free will philosophy and this sex magic practice in the gnostic mass so they were very well much welcome and so it became developed quite a lot and um, people like Jack Parsons got introduced to the OTO in Los Angeles as a young rocket scientist, uh, as well as some people like Grady Louis, Louis McMurtry, who became then uh, the leader of the OTO by, uh, later on in the, in the 1960s and 70s. So I see it's already 35. Um, so Jack Parson was really young when he, he was introduced to cinema. He got married with a woman called Ellen Northrup here on the, in the white, on the left photo. Um, they got married, got introduced to cinema, but soon um, uh, Parsons got interested and got a relation with his sister, Sarah Northrup, which is a very, she was very, she was my Mina and, um, and the, and she was a very good, very engaged practitioner in the Tilima and the OTO group. Um, soon, during the World War II, Parsons was developing the rocket science and the jet propulsion laboratory, but in parallel, he met with, uh, he was very much interested in the science fiction community. So he met uh, Robert Enlein, uh, the author of uh, various science fiction novels of the time, and also uh, L. Ron Hubbard, uh, who was known for this uh, book Fear, a bit of a, let's say, um, uh, horror no novel. Uh, we could say um, very much influenced by uh, um, uh, H.P. Lovecraft, um, but became quite famous at the time with this Fear novel, and he met with uh, this weird science fiction writer called L. Ron Newbold. They got, became friends. Um, the Church of Tinema was then moved to the, because Jack Parson became rich with the science fiction. Uh, what's happening here? The, um, yeah, sorry. The, um, the group of Tinema, since Jack Parson was becoming rich and wealthy with the rocket science, he bought a big mansion in uh, Pasadena and started to host all the uh, all the Templi Orientis 
members in his house and it became a, a, a place that was very much uh, surveyed by the FBI and he uh, hosted at some point Elron Newbert. Elron Newbert got along with Stara Northrop at the time and they became engaged, they, they, they split it with Northrop. It's a bit of a lot of love stories, but, um, and then Jack Parsons met uh, Marjorie Cameron in 1945 and Cameron Hubert and himself started to play rituals of the OTO of a certain degree involving sex magic trying to somehow, um, they were using a lot of drugs as well. And at some point, Jack Parson started to really feel he would, they would be reincarnating John Dee and his, and his channeler uh, with Elron Newbold. But Elron Newbold was a, a kind of a crook. He convinced Jack Parson to start a company uh, of um, boat rentals. Uh, Parson put all his money in the company, but had eventually at some point, Rue Hubbard and Sanatra left with the money and, 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 and Parson ended up bankrupt. Um, anyway, with um, uh, Cameron, Marjorie Cameron, she was an artist and she, they started to work together. Here you have drawings of Cameron or paintings. You have one of um, on the right, maybe you don't see it well, but it's um, Jack Parson as an antichrist or like, so very spiritual paintings of, of Cameron. They started to also to, to write books. And for the story of Elron Newbald, then later, like a few years later, with the money he stole from Jack Parson, he, they could settle with Sarah Northrop and start the, to write the Dianetics uh, books that would set the ground for the Scientology church. Um, eventually it didn't go very well between Northrop and uh, Newbald. At some point there was a, they, they divorced, they got, uh, they got, they had a kid in the, uh, the kid, Hubert kidnapped the kid, it, it ended up in the trial and, and, and uh, uh, Sarah Northrop has been persecuted by Scientology for many years, many years afterwards. Um, also here you have a FBI investigation on the famous house of Jack Parsons on 1,000 Grove Avenue in Pasadena, where you can read a religious cult believed to advocate sexual perversion was organized at Subject Home Pasadena, which had been reported subversive, and that subject has been questioned regarding that organization. And uh, they refer even like they could also be associated with one alleged member of Communist Party was Jack uh, 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 Frank Malina, who was a member of the Communist Student Union. So they were really under surveillance from, uh, from the FBI. They got fired or they had to leave the space industry. Uh, uh, Frank Malina left and fled to France, basically. He was a, uh, uh, he was a fugitive uh, in Paris for many years during all the McCarthy years. Parsons ended up very, very bad at the age of 76. He died in an explosion in his own home. Since he had no job, he was working on special effects for cinema and someone blew himself in his lab. Um, and uh, after this um, uh, explosion and death, uh, the police investigations uh, found many, many uh, occultist um, um, documents or uh, ceremonial tools or all kinds of stuff in his house. And it became some kind of a scandal in, in Los Angeles. You see like the dead scientist, black magic cult. And um, Cameron was uh, also harassed as a cult member. Uh, mother committed suicide when she learned all about this. So where he ended up not so good. Uh, but Cameron continued to pursue with uh, publishing the legacy of Parsons. So he published several essays uh, about uh, the free will and of Jack Parsons, such a book, Freedom is a Two-Edged Sword. Uh, herself, she joined um, the new big generation scene of uh, Los Angeles, uh, participated in the seminar newspaper, uh, seminar fanzine or, or art, art book. They, she published some books with uh, drawings of herself and text of, of Parsons. Uh, then she started also to work in cinema. Here it's a photogram from a, um, 
uh, a film from uh, the 1950s uh, uh, called uh, Nine Tide, where she play a witch. Um, and here on the left, she's in the, uh, in, 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 uh, under the pleasure dome, um, the film from, um, oh, I forgot the name now, um, uh, uh, the filmmaker from Los Angeles who did several underground films and where she also very much Korean philosophy influence. I forgot the name now. Anyway, I'm going to, maybe it would come back. And here on the right, you have, um, so she had a strong reputation of being a witch. Here she played Ikati in the in the movie and the, and with her, along with Anais Nin and other actors. And here on the right, it's a, a old life. She, she, she passed away in the 90s and uh, had a strong reputation of being a witch. And I think I'm going to stop here. And I hope it was not too chaotic. I was trying to give a lot of information in a, in a short time. But I'm happy to answer and give more details of questions. Yes. Questions. Thank you so much, Iwan. Uh, I always love this uh, space and occult stories uh, because they, yeah, I mean, what it, I don't know, you know, like in space is a very clear example of how there are magical ideas behind what we know, and that in some way those magical ideas. Uh, influence like really huge things um so and today i feel that a lot of that magical thinking is is gone um but well we can talk a lot about this so okay let's go with questions um okay uh chloe let's let's do it thank you for the talk um i first of all just um, just a practical question. What was the quote? You read out quite a long quote, and I want. Um, and was it from the the Journal of Immortality? About halfway through the talk, it was from the Russian Cosmist book, of, edited by Boris Groys, and um, it's called the yeah, Russian Cosmist. It's published by MIT Press. And it's uh, from the biocosmist uh, group. This, you, uh, you see, no, I know. <laughs> I have uh, no, sorry. It's called, uh, yeah, the book is Russian Cosmism, edited by Boris Groys, and it's MIT Press. And I took the text called Biocosmist Poetics from Alexander Sviatogor, which has a very interesting quote. It's like, I like the one saying, our Earth must become a spaceship steered by the wise will of the biocosmist which when you read that, you think of Buckminster Fuller so 50 years later, somehow, and it's, oh, it's in 1922. It's, for me, very interesting in terms of this continuity of history, mm -hmm. of ideas. Thank you. Um, and then I also wanted to ask what you think now about, I mean, you spoke a lot about, I think in the first half as well, about, art and science being so intertwined and with um, uh, science fiction and stuff. And I wondered what, if you had any ideas about, for example, the education system, I don't know in other countries, but in England where, and I think most uh, Western countries where the art and sciences are so completely detached from each other um, and the arts are being less and less funded what you if you have any ideas about this in relation to what you spoke about today um, it's kind of a i don't really know what the answer could be um, um but if it's somehow like limiting our um if we're not studying if the two aren't together is that somehow limiting our, our study of science or somehow limiting our study of art for oh, yeah. example like did the study of science fiction then help science? And if that's not happening now, I just wondered if you have any thoughts about this. Mm. Um, sad to say, um, I think most lot of scientists with science fiction or, or sometimes are interested in art, not all of them, but often scientists go more and more into a very tiny, tiny detail they really go deep in a, in a, in a very tiny 
research field. I noticed a lot because I, I worked a lot in art and science connections. And sometimes you ask them something, I know I'm not specialist of that, I can't talk. And often the science fiction, like such an author like Kim Stanley Robinson, they give really a great picture of uh, science development of a time. They can somehow get inspired by many things, but uh, uh, I guess it's influencing. But often the scientists, they don't feel allowed to speak when they have such a specialized field and the reputation is at stake and if they start to become too, too, you know, too broad in what they, what they talk about. Um, it really depends on society. So I'm, some are really open to composite collaborations. They understand they have to work with designers. They understand they have to work with uh, people with different skills, including artists. Uh, but some are really not interested at all and really stay focused on, on, on uh, really scientific uh, uh, methodology, very, very narrow. Myself, I've been working in the field of biology, uh, marine biology lately. And they, they, they understand, I mean, the scientists I work with at least understand like we can bring over um, certain skills that can be useful for their research when they don't have access in the lab because it's marine biology lab. And when you talk about electronics and they, you have do it yourself, I don't know, Arduinos and stuff like that. And suddenly they are a bit lost. They don't have this at all in the marine biology lab and they come to us and to, uh, and then I take them to hackerspace and meet to, to put them in touch with some like uh, geeky engineers that can do electronics and then they start to work together. Um, and also, of course, the artistic mind or let's say philosophical mind, anthropological perspective on science can also very be, be very inspiring sometimes. Sometimes it makes things get go faster for the scientists, like how to summarize their own ideas. And sometimes by discussion, it can help, but it's it's not easy to say. It depends really of the scientists. Some are open, some are like really narrow. They don't know, they don't even know a clue about art. And it really depends. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it answers your question, but no, I, I'm not desperate and I keep continuing trying to make scientists meet artists and this vice versa. <laughs> Thank you. Great, uh, Jamal. Yeah, yes. Thank you very much for this uh, super new information for me. It's really uh, amazing to, to see that. Uh, what I was wondering, and you were already referring to this uh, uh, in your answer now, is that when you look towards the future or the, um, let's say, the present, um, do you think there will be at some point um, a really uh, dedicated space for, for the the spiritual and, and, and the occult, as you described it? Or will it always be um, sort of this niche underground thing? So not, not I mean, you, you already spoke about, uh, okay, you have artistic residencies at uh, um, science institutions, but I was wondering if you look, for example, at the space industry now, and that you have a certain commercialization going on that we go into the wrong direction, or do you see this? maybe getting better in the, into the future or maybe there's some uh, do you have a positive or, or <laughs> pessimistic outlook <laughs> thank you well i think the space industry is, is going to a bull run at the moment it's a bit like cryptocurrencies it's kind of exploding it's a lot of new new things coming on coming in for the next decade so the industry is developing really much um, um, I don't know, but what, what what made me think about like how to see the future and how the occult on the or even the um, let's say um, uh, mythologies, you know, um, some 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 mythology, some will of humankind has always been present, like the will of the the, the immortality, will of immortality is already present in the in the Noah's Ark, Great Flood, like. You know, you have before Noah's Ark, they live 1,000 years and they got punished and they live only 100 years. And in the, the uh, Gilgamesh as well, there is like immortality dimension, like one gain immortality. So um, it's always been, uh, you have like recurring mythical uh, wish of humankind, like immortal, space travel, but also, I don't know, uh, uh, telepathy. Um, you know, talking only with the mind, or these things come again and again in history, and the occult of often, or the fringe scientists always like 
explore those fields. So I think it's like transhumanistic ideas today of extending human life, even going towards immortality. It's a bit the same. So it's, it's a recurrent uh, and it's rooted in, um, in a prehistoric uh, or historic uh, early age of uh, writings, first books, Gilgamesh, or, you know, the Bible already has that. And so um, it's coming again and again. So in the medieval times, maybe as soon as there are new sciences coming, this revive those old dreams that are rooted in, uh, in, uh, in old spiritualities. So I guess this is going to continue somehow. As soon as you have like new tech, they will, oh, yeah, new cult or new uh, driving force. Um, transhumanistic now, like cryogeny or whatever, they, they create this crazy all uh, spiritual half uh, fringe science groups that can be appear to be somehow cultist as well. So I guess we are also mortal, so we have a very short lifespan, and we want to learn a lot of things during with our lifespan, but it's short. So life is a quick form, and um, that's why also cults exist because they introduce you to some knowledge much faster than you if you would learn by, by yourself by reading books. That's why they have degrees, um, like in Freemason tradition, like you learn faster, you have masters that teach you like the tradition, the knowledge, um, because we are mortal and we have a very short life to learn all, all possible knowledge from of humankind. So. So some people are very passionate in that and go that direction and go into cults, uh, Freemason or Rosicrucian, whatever groups, to try to get more and more uh, tradition knowledge. So I guess I'm going a bit away, but yeah, science has an influence on that too. Um, and this recurrent mythologies come back again and again. So I guess you're gonna see this as soon as new tech will appear there will be other generation with new uh, new kind of weird cults and taking inspiration from older ones perfect thank you Iwan uh, I have one question uh, you know like in this period I mean there was a period in Soviet times uh, where in Russia they as far as I know little is known also about this topic there were different like research centers dedicated to very like speculative uh, research. For example, we know that uh, there was one for space and it, it actually happened. There was uh, other places that were for the science of resurrection, for nuclear energy. And sometimes, as far as I've been able to, to, to read it, sometimes they would have two of these cities in different parts. So they would provide, so they, they created like this artificial like competition to see which one will provide, will, will give the, mm -hmm. the best results. Do you know anything about these cities? I mean, today still we have Star City. Yeah. Mm, I'm not sure what you're talking about, but um, there were also, I'm not sure. Kaluga was quite a city. Uh, it's um, traditionally was also a city of theosophy um, with publisher of occult texts and uh, spiritual books. Mm. And it became also a center of uh, this fringe uh, cosmism or biocosmism, or all this kind of interest where also like Fyodorov influence went to Kaluga. But I, I don't exactly see what you mean with the cities. I'm not so aware about that. Mm. But there were some schools and some, um, they were supported, but it was very short time, you know? It was all these avant-garde was only uh, during the Lenin times. And as soon as Stalin took over, they were all closed and, uh, you know, yeah. put in prison and all this euphoria of uh, new ideas of the revolution was like killed afterwards. All mm -hmm. this left, they were called left, Bolshev, left yeah. communism, left scientist. Yeah. Also, I mean, like, I wonder to, to what extent these were like Soviet constructs. For example, one of the critiques to, co to Cosmism is that uh, there was never such a movement, that there were a group of people thinking very different ideas. And during Soviet times, someone saw the opportunity of creating a narrative of 
uh, of a spiritual movement called Cosmists, but in reality, Fyodorov didn't talk to the other ones and, 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 and so on. Uh, perhaps the closest relationship was Fyodorov and Tcholkovsky, but, but then it was a story created. So I wonder how um, much you, of these you, are constructions? Yeah, well, it was probably partly created. I mean, Bogdanov was uh, influenced by uh, readings of, Turk, of Fyodorov, but he was also, you know, uh, uh, influenced by other science philosophers of the time. Um, I would say still the Bolshevik party has uh, had a strong group. Uh, you, you know, Bronk Bruyevich, who was a minister of the the cults of the religion, they also based a lot uh, the revolution on the alternative spirituality that, that was a way to fight the main Orthodox church that was very, you know, the Tsar and the main Orthodox church was very criticized very uh, in the 1910s. And so they, the Bolshevik uh, took um, advantage of working with these minor spiritual groups this, uh, like the Dukobo, they were specialists of that. They did a lot of research in the 19 and the 1910. Um, Bong did his books and PhD, went to Canada, followed the Dukobo movement, like you know, those naked protesters, uh, like a branch of a uh, strange branch of Christianity, or um, uh, others who were like the, the Scots and the, Sc the Sc Scopsi. We are like cutting their organs, emasculate themselves, um, all kind of very strange uh, spiritual groups. Um, and they took advantage on, because as soon as they were criticizing the Orthodox Church, they, they, were, they get supported by those groups. And, and when the Lenin died, still there was a committee that was created for the resurrection of Lenin so to, you know, to try to preserve the body of Lenin to maybe science can resurrect later on. That was really a Fyodorov idea. And Krasin, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs at the time was a leader of that group. And he was very much into Fyodorov ideas. And so they were really trying to, at, after a few days realize they will never manage, but they were still trying to go that direction, like to preserve Lenin's body and that science will resurrect it. Mayakovsky wrote a poem saying, Lenin is dead, Lenin will live again, you know, this kind of thing. They were, it was very present in this belief of science and electricity will save, will create the Soviet Russia, but also uh, resurrect uh, the great leaders and extend life. And in the communist mythology, main, after Lenin, many other dictators also try to do that, like preserve the body and now they will what cryogenize their body and maybe to get resurrected in, few, in a decade or two when it chance would bring possible. So it's 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 kind of strange. I've been, always been very intrigued with that. Mm, okay, okay. So I think time is over. But just one quick question from Tutti Frutti: Can you point to specific uh, ideas in the space race that were inspired by occultism? A specific idea inspired by occultism. Mm -hmm. mm. I would say space race was a lot inspired by occultism. Basically, the entire space race. No? <laughs> Maybe yeah. not the entire, because it comes also from aeronautics and from classic literature as well. I mean, it's this dream of space, travel to space is already in uh, mm. Greek, ancient Greek, when the boat take, is taken to oh. outer space. Chinese. Oh, no, Chinese. Like, yeah, yeah. The guy that went with. Uh, rockets in a chair yeah yeah so yeah um it's in space race but it's also in a in this vision what, what i'm really into is this vision of the like in the biocosmic when they refer the planet as a spaceship you know um that's a biocosmic so we will all be biocosmist and have a planet as a spaceship but also the, so this very strong knowledge of the planet as a biosphere, uh, you know, uh, Vernadsky, the scientist who wrote the book, The Biosphere in the 1920s, or Russian, he was also very much influenced by the biocosmist ideas. Um, so seeing the planet as a biosphere traveling through, wandering through space, 
And so uh, it's a lot, in, in a way space travel, but it's also the birth of ecology and the, the, the knowledge of like our planet to be fragile and, and the biosphere that has been wisely, need to be wisely steered by the biocosmist. So I guess uh, this, um, yeah, this blue marble ID and this uh, uh, spaceship Earth of uh, 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 Mr. Fuller comes also from that, from the Natsuki, from the biospherians and the, you know, biosphere too. Um, the project in Arizona. So the Biosphere book, it's a Russian book in the, from the 20s. So I guess this is also something that comes from an interesting background um, from biocosmic philosophy. Perfect. Iwan, thank you so much for this talk today. Uh, so if, if any of the researchers would like to get in touch, what's the best way to do it? Um, Give my email. <laughs> okay. Do you think you can type I, I it in wish the chat? We could be physically together and we could have a, a drink yeah. and talk one more hour afterwards. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I wish that too. Okay, <laughs> okay. You want, please, can you type in the, in the chat your email? Yeah. Just in case. Perfect. So thank you so much, everyone, for listening and see you very soon.